Well, my Lord Lieutenant, Your Grace, uh, the Right Reverend Sirs, Mr. Dean, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this evening's uh, event, a conversation with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Rowan Williams. Uh, more interestingly, uh, Twitter, uh, usually at these events, you know, the first thing you say is, please everyone turn off your mobile phones. What I'm going to say instead is, please make sure your phones are on silent for any uh, young, hip and cool, trendy people who want to use uh, Twitter. Uh, you're welcome to join in the Twitter commentary. So I only sort of know what that means because I joined Twitter very recently. So I'm if, you're <laughs> if you're tweeting, <laughs> please use hash Surrey underscore ABC for Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and follow the event. <laughs> and follow the event at at Uni of Surrey Live. Now, if you, if you Twitter, you'll probably know what this means. I sort of know. Um, I hope you all realise that um, you have question cards uh, and pens on your seats when you came in. Um, those of you who want to uh, ask the Archbishop uh, a question, please. Fill in, you have sort of about 30 or so minutes to, to come up with your question if you want to. Ushers will be coming around to collect all the cards, um, so please have yours ready. What happens is that the question cards will then be given to the Archbishop uh, to select at random, or otherwise, um, <laughs> uh, the questions that he, he, will, he, he would like to, to answer. So, so we'll, we, he'll have an opportunity to look through those during a brief five minute interlude when we'll be showing you a short film. A uh, very important point that obviously there's no guarantee that your, your question will be picked, of course. Right, well, that's, that's all that, the, the housekeeping, so uh, on with the show. And, and good evening, Archbishop. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a, a list of questions. I don't know if I'll have time to ask all of them, so I, I've got questions that I, I'm really keen to, to, to ask you and others uh, we can do without if we run out of time. Um, my first question is... is, is one in which I'd like to draw a, a, a tenuous link between uh, uh, my role and yours, if I may be so bold. Um, I, I, I spend half of my time in academia as a, as a professor of physics, and the other half of the time in public life, in, in uh, public engagement of science. And I've certainly found, not so much now, but I've certainly found when I began that public life was seen somehow as uh, dirty, uh, not something that I should be doing, I should be focusing on my research. You started off as an academic, uh, I, I mean, you, you were professor of divinity at the, the ridiculously young age of late 20s, I think. <laughs> but but, but so, so as a pure you know, academic professor of divinity, and as you've progressed in your career, you've, you've moved more and more into public life. So my first question is this, do you feel uh, somehow that you might be viewed by the more, the purest um, theologians in academia as someone who's not sold out because after all you've pretty much made it big as it were <laughs> but, 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 it, but did they perceive public, the, the work they do in public life somehow more vulgar than the, the, than the pure th theory of the, the theology it's a very interesting question but I think two things would qualify an answer there one is that there's always been a certain coming and going between theological academics and the public life of the church, so it's not a new thing. And the other is, if you like, the other way around, that when I was an academic, I was also a working priest. So it's not been hermetically sealed compartments. I think part of the problem, and maybe you find this too, is you're in between two worlds, both of which think you belong to the other one. So... Um, yeah. There are times when, goodness only knows why, people think I sound a bit too academic in public. And um, <laughs> you know, the Daily Mail will say, you've got to remember you're not in a university now. Um, and it's no good trying to see both sides of a question anymore. Um, <laughs> and, and <laughs> at, at the same time, on, on the other side, there is, there is just a touch of that. Um, well, we know you're, you're not a real scholar any longer. You have to say these absurdly simplistic things in public. So there is a bit of discomfort both ways around, I, mm. I reckon. Mm. 
Now, as a, as a as scientist, I'm, I'm interested to hear your views, and I'm sure you won't be surprised to know that I'll be interested to hear your views on modern science. I'm a big fan of John Polkinghorne, mm. who's, who's probably mm. the most famous contemporary Christian physicist. Um, I, I, for instance, I'm well aware that you have no issues with Darwin's theory of natural selection. How, how do you uh, and, and, and the church address creationists? And you know, as scientists, we, we are very aware and concerned about the rise in creationism. How do you address it? How do you mm. reconcile that and, and, con and convince them otherwise? Mm. Well, one way of getting at it, I think, is just to try and clarify what Christians do and don't mean by the doctrine of creation. To me, the trouble with creationism is that it suggests not only did God make the world, he went on sort of anxiously fiddling with it. So it's not just a matter of God creating the world right, right at the start, but every so often God gives a little twitch to the, the mechanism. And that suggests to me, well, perhaps it wasn't good enough to start with, and that's not any great compliment to God. As I understand it, the doctrine of creation says very flatly and simply, what you need to know is that whatever is depends ultimately on God's choice and God's action. We're here because God wanted us here, as a universe, that is. And that's the, the thing which was quite surprising and quite new in the intellectual climate of the ancient world, in some ways. It's still, I think, a, an extraordinarily liberating doctrine in many ways because it says that we are wanted or we are invited into being. And I think you lose sight of that if you get too focused on this, uh, as I say, this rather anxious picture of a God who's <coughs> adjusting all the way along. Now, I think, again, you have to say about creationism, is it reading the Bible correctly? Is it understanding what kind of text the Bible is? And I think the beginning, the first couple of chapters of Genesis, again, tell us what we need to know. What is exists because God invites it into being. From the very beginning, things have gone badly wrong with the human race. Um, and God has not yet given up on us. Now, that's, that's quite a good start. But all of that seems to me obscured by getting into, you know, ditches you ought not to be dying in into the sort of trench warfare of yep, yep. creationism, intelligent design and so forth, trying to meet scientists mm -hmm. on their own territory when that's not actually what Genesis gives you the, the ammunition for. Now, famously, certainly on, on, on TV programs that I've seen, you've, you've um, come up against Richard Dawkins, that mm. stalwart of atheism. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, my view is love him or loathe him, he certainly brought this issue mm. of um, not so much you know, science versus faith, but I mean, you know, one way to say, I mean, because personally I'm an atheist, I, I would say that you know, he's made atheism respectable in the sense that he's put himself at some extreme militant atheism and allowed other atheists who would rather not insult those of faith more middle of the road, <laughs> more cuddly atheism. So, so you can be the acceptable face. <laughs> so I, can, yeah. Yeah, right. I, I always say it used to be that you know, the atheist <laughs> was, was a rather extreme stance and, and, and it was much more sensible to be agnostic. But now that we have Richard Dawkins, it's, it's, it's okay to be atheist. <laughs> um, do, do you feel that that's it, it's a good thing, the, what he's done in terms of getting this debate out in the open to talk about faith and why, uh, you know, whether there are tensions between faith yeah. and rationality um, or faith and science? Mm. I must say, I, I don't lose too much sleep over Richard Dawkins in the sense that... I'm, I'm I, guessing I, you didn't. <laughs> in, in the sense that these are controversies that break the surface in intellectual life every 30 years or so. And there's usually a kind of, um, just as we have an astronomer royal, we almost have an atheist royal. You know, we have some <laughs> big public intellectual figure, Bertrand Russell or whoever, and now Richard Dawkins, who is the atheist you turn to for public comment on things. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. The difficulty is, I think, when something gets into the, the bloodstream of our corporate mind through this, which, which keeps nagging away, well, you know, religion and science are really incompatible after all, aren't they? Some of the mud sticks. And I think that's a pity. I also think it's a pity that um, what I'd call the non-scientific bits of Richard Dawkins's worldview stick around too. And by that I mean 
Richard Dawkins is not just an evolutionary biologist. He's also somebody who's advanced some highly speculative theses around that, the theory of, of memes, memes and things yeah. like that, um, which, from a philosophical standpoint, I cannot make head or tail of. And that again gets a bit into the bloodstream. And the notion that you can simply abstract a highly successful thesis from biology and genetics, evolution, natural selection, and then apply it right across the board to self solve every single problem going, I think that really is duffed. And that's where we ought to be concentrating our attention. But one other thing that actually I think is very important and positive about Richard Dawkins is that when he wants to be, he's a superb communicator of the excitement of science. And that big fat book of his called The Ancestor's Tale, mm. I think is just wonderful as, as popular science. And he communicates not only excitement, but a sense of almost religious mystery about it. Um, I rather mischievously quoted a passage from that in, in a Christmas sermon in Canterbury a year or so ago, as we were challenging people to, to spot the author. <laughs> I don't think Richard would thank me for it. But <laughs> um, on the subject of, again, this is, for me, um, as, as an atheist, it's an interesting question, the subject of, of, of ethics and, and values and morality. Um, I'm sure you've been asked this many times. To what extent do you feel religion is, is necessary to, to set society's moral and ethical boundaries? Because, you know, I would say that, of course, uh, I'm, I'm fully capable of having my own moral compass and I know what's right or wrong. Um, I don't need religion to tell me yeah. what's right or wrong, of course. So, so what is your, indeed the church, response to this? I think it's perfectly possible, obviously, as a matter of fact, for people to have that sense of a moral compass without necessarily having religious convictions. I would, though, say that um, you then need to work rather hard to explain why that sense of a moral compass isn't just arbitrary or isn't just your decision, but might be rooted in something something about the way the universe is. And for me, what the religious dimension does is to say, the person struggling to live a good life isn't just exercising a set of individual choices. They are somehow making visible the way reality is, ultimately for me, of course, the way God is, God, creator and redeemer. And I always feel there's, there's a bit of a gap somewhere. So people may make the right choices, have the right philosophy of life in terms of ethics, and yet I would want to say, so where is it grounded, ultimately? And it's not exactly a knock-down argument, but I, it does seem to me a gap there. You need some, some anchorage for it if it's not just to be a matter of chance preferences. So you, ha you have a moral compass, but you don't know why? Yeah, um, and for me, the moral compass, of course, is rooted in the way we are. Now, I, I recently made a TV series on uh, medieval Islam and mm. science in, mm. in, in medieval Islam. And, and um, I certainly uh, encountered many Muslims who view science with suspicion. Mm. They see it as a, an, an, a Western, secular, even atheist construct. Mm. And, and so they're, they're, they're sort of quite suspicious mm. of it. Um, Sadly, one sees this in the 21st century, not just in, uh, among Muslims, but among, right. among, among all other faiths as well. Um, do you have any advice for me and others who, who, who want to engage with, with people of faith who, who are suspicious of science um, in a way that isn't dismissive of their beliefs and faiths in the way mm. that Dawkins would, mm. would, would be attacked? I think I'd probably home in on that extraordinary period in broadly Western philosophical history between, let's say, about 900 and about 1400, where Christian, Muslim and Jewish thinkers were all of them thinking very hard and very much in dialogue with each other mm. about the nature of God and the nature of the universe. And anyone who thinks that interfaith dialogue is a, a thing of the 20th and 21st century, you look at the way in which the great figures of the Middle Ages interacted, commented on each other, mm. absorbed each other's vision, and it's, it's all there. And one of the themes that comes through there is God is consistent. God is not just a kind of 
arbitrary tyrant. God is consistent. God is reasonable in the broadest possible sense. And therefore, the world God has made is a world in which you can expect consistency, rationality, some kind of coherence. And that belief for Christians, Muslims, and Jews in the Middle Ages was actually one of the things that made science possible. In the Muslim world, rather ahead of the others, in fact. Christians caught up a bit, though some of the Muslim roots actually go back further to what they had read of Syrian translations by Christians of Greek texts. And mm. so you've got, a, again, a great intermingling. So actually, the tradition of religious philosophy is bound in with, with the scientific enterprise, far more than many people realize. And I'd want to say to any religious person who felt there was a kind of natural incompatibility there, well, look at the history. Look at what, look at what your faith made possible. Mm. because it was your faith that made it possible. I'm always interested when, when I read about how uh, medieval Muslim theologians were driven to, to read about Aristotelian philosophy yes. because they had to hone their arguments against the Christian and Jewish theologians yes. who'd yes. had a head start on them. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And Christians similarly um, Swatting up. up on Aristotle to catch Top up on these the, arguments. Yes. So Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, absorbing Aristotle, very controversial stuff at the time, so that he could provide the right sort of response to Muslim thinkers like Avicenna. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Maimonides. And Maimonides. Maimonides, Maimonides yes. Maimonides, yes. Yeah. Um, you have a reputation of being um, quite orthodox in, in, in Christian faith, but probably radical oh, in your social <laughs> agenda. <laughs> <laughs> You're not controversial, I think. <laughs> but but, but a, a lot of your, 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 in your public life, in your social agenda, I think you're, you're probably quite radical and outspoken on, on many issues. Um, there's strong emphasis in your life about regenerating communities and working with, with, with the poor, supporting the underprivileged. Um, I'm aware you, you were... The, your leadership in Drop the Debt campaign and the, the Jubilee 2000 campaign to remove third world debt. Um, how is that going now? How, how, how do, you, do you feel you've had some, made some headway or had some success in this? Hmm. One of the important things about the, um, the Jubilee 2000 campaign about international debt, I think, was that it, it had a clear goal about cancelling unpayable debt and a clear cutoff point. And it was possible, I suppose, to, to feel you, you'd done it, you, you'd know when you'd done it. We've not had a campaign quite like that since. Make Poverty History is a, a tremendous vision. But you know, how, do, how do I know when I've made Poverty History? And is poverty over yet? Well, actually, no. When will it be? We'll know it when we see it. So one of the problems we face, I think, in public lobbying about some of these big international issues is they're too big and it feels as if campaigning on some of these things you won't ever get to the end of it and people like to feel there's a sort of landmark that they can point to. So I think the important thing is to try and keep up people's morale in campaigns like this and say, well, set to yourself limited targets, which is better than nothing, and don't despair because you can't change everything at once. I think this is one of the major messages that has to get across where, let's say, climate change is concerned. People think, oh, well, you know, we're all doomed, so why bother? And it's important to say, yes, but you can actually make some measurable difference to the quality of life enjoyed not only in this country but in the poorest parts of the world by making certain decisions about energy use and so forth. So I think that's, that's part of the challenge we're up against at the moment. You feel it's important that you engage in these political mm -hmm. issues, I guess. And you spoke at the Copenhagen I did, summit yes, as yes. well. Um, I know you've, uh, you've quoted, uh, oh, um, you stated that bishops have no option but to take up the cause of the environment, not because of what the world says, but because it's inherent in your faith. Mm. Um, as a scientist, it's very important for me to, to get across to the general public 
how science works. And so, for instance, on the issue of climate change, it's very worrying for me that, that, that the small band of climate change deniers are leaping on issues like the East Anglia the email US, debacle yes, and, yes, and, and, and yes. the I, uh, IPCC exaggerations about the Himalayan ice melting. Um, how do you respond to climate change deniers? With, with puzzlement, really. Um, I can see that people will want to hold us to the fact that we're dealing in probabilities, not cast iron certainties. That's, that's fine, that's fair enough. But it seems to me that on almost any analysis, we as the human inhabitants of this planet have been responsible for altering the circumstances in which we live. I don't see how you can deny that. You can argue about the measure of it, you can argue about the proportion between um, human-generated and natural causes outside our control. But even if, even if you were to allow a very large measure of scepticism there, you might still, I, I would still want to say, we have environmental degradation, which impacts horribly on the most vulnerable, and we ought to do something about it. So don't get too bogged down in in the science, I say it with respect, <laughs> but there clearly is an issue about which something can be done. And so to the denier, I'd say, well, if you insist on denying it, okay, but can you not recognize that there is an agenda? Wherever it comes from, there's mm -hmm. an agenda here. Uh, I think I'll keep going for another 10 minutes or so before we uh, open up questions. I'd like to come back to, to, to the issue of faith and, mm. and, and uh, actually the, the idea of prayer, which I find mm. quite difficult to, to, to fathom. Um, and it's, it's, it's such a, a well-trodden ar argument, I know, but in, in a world of inhumanity, you know, suffering and natural disaster, how do you continue to pray? I mean, mm. is, is, is your Christian faith a comfort or a struggle? How do you cope with, say, Haiti? Haiti. Mm. The person who prays about Haiti isn't, I think, first and foremost saying to God, you sort it out because I can't, but somehow trying to open their own life to enough of God's love for a difference to be made becoming a channel in, in some way for a healing purpose or a restoring purpose. That can work itself out in practical ways, actually doing something about it, giving, getting involved. If that's not possible, then the Christian makes the very bold assumption, as I think do people of other faiths, just opening your mind and heart to that somehow brings into the world something of God's action and God's freedom that can, in principle, make a difference. So I think in these horrible circumstances, it's not, it's not a matter of how on earth can anybody pray in the middle of that. People do. People just do. They want to connect the horror of the situation with the love of God somehow. They want to be a place where those two frames of reference overlap. The dreadfulness, the urgency of suffering and the unchanging fact of God. There are no, I've said it many times now, there are no theories that'll get you through that. But in the middle of it, amazingly, people do just this. They try to make themselves a place where that can come in. I've, I've quoted several times um, in the last couple of years the really remarkable statement of Etty Hillison, the young Jewish woman who died in Auschwitz in the 40s and whose diaries are a fantastic source of inspiration. Not a very religious person, but as the persecution gets more serious in Amsterdam and she realizes that she's at risk, she, she steps further into faith, not further away from it, because she says, somebody's got to take responsibility for God. Somebody's got to live in this world as if God were real. Somebody's got to, again, live in that overlap between the horror of the situation and the utter liberty and love of God. And that's the role she, she takes on. I've got to live as if that were true. 
And as I say, she's someone coming from a, a very secular, secularized Jewish background and becoming more a person of faith as the darkness closes around her. It's an extraordinary story, and that says something to me about prayer. Now, you're close to the World Trade Center, 9-11, mm. uh, and uh, I know you've, you've written on what you saw and encountered that day. Mm. Has the experience changed the course of your work in ministry, uh, if at all? Mm. It was, I suppose, the nearest I've, I've been to death, and that in itself makes mm. a difference, being um, a block away. You know, none of us knew if we were going to get out alive. Um, being close to death gives you a bit of a sense of priorities, mm. the sort of things that do and don't matter, when you've sort of looked into that. And it's certainly sharpened up my own personal commitment about trying to find the words and the relations of reconciliation that somehow help to make that sort of nightmare a bit less likely. Um, I, I was back there um, in Lower Manhattan just mm, three or four weeks ago, and I've been back twice to the site, and it's, it's quite hard work. And I realize when I'm back there that it has sunk in, but in ways which, beyond what I've already said, are quite difficult to formalize, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think it was, it's Hans Kuhn, the uh, controversial Swiss theologian, uh, who said, there'll be no peace among the nations without peace among the religions. Uh, and there'll be no peace among the religions without dialogue among the religions. I know you're very much engaged in interfaith dialogue, so maybe you could tell me a little bit more about the interfaith work you're doing. Mm. Well, it's, it's quite a spread, really, because um, on the one hand, there's a long-standing relationship with the Council for Christians and Jews, and that's been part of my life for, ooh, I suppose, nearly 20 years now and a, a very fruitful, engaged, sometimes quite difficult conversation there. I guess it's really in the last um, seven or eight years that the dialogue with Islam has become more possible. And that, that works at a number of levels. Um, it works at the international level because I convene each year a group of about 30 leaders and scholars from across the world, Christian and Muslim balance of people, and we have a week looking at, um, looking at each other's scriptures, really, and trying to draw out general insights, not from talking in generalities, but from looking at what's there. Looking not at picking the holes in each other's scriptures. No, no, <laughs> but trying to, to watch the other person or listen to the other person reading their scriptures yeah. and say, what, what have we got to learn? How, how do we understand more? So we've looked at um, issues around public life around um, justice and law and right, the role of women. We've looked at slightly narrower theological questions. Who is Abraham in our traditions? Um, what do we mean by the word prophet? And these have been very exciting, enriching conversations, which we've deliberately not sought to make particularly public. They're for the people involved. These are quite often fairly influential thinkers and intellectuals across the board, um, and I think all those involved, and it's been a fairly steady core group, would have said they come away enriched by that. At another level, the Christian Muslim Forum in this country, launched a few years ago, tries to build, build bridges again at grassroots level to encourage local Christian and Muslim communities to find out what they can do together what the needs of the community they share are, what might be the priorities in community regeneration, education, or whatever. And that, that too, is an exciting project. So there's all of that. And then sometimes you try and put bits of the jigsaw together and have the three-cornered conversations with the Abrahamic faiths. And we also continue to work quite hard at developing a dialogue with, um, with Hindus in this country, which has proved a bit more complicated because 
there are, there are different um, networks to relate to who don't always relate to each other very easily. And so that's, that's a challenge, but we work at that. So there's quite a lot of it going on. And purely personally, I've for a long time been fascinated by Buddhism, especially the meditational traditions of Buddhism, and try to keep that as, as an interest and a concern that just personally I follow through. And that brings us nicely to the, the, the multi-faith center that we are yes, hoping to yes. have here at Surrey, which uh, yes. it, it, personally, I, it's something that I know would work. I mean, I grew up in a household with a, 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 a church-going Christian mother, a Shiite Muslim father. I, <laughs> I okay fall in between the two stools, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, th there was never any conflict. There was always, the, the, the interfaith dialogue was there in, in, in my house growing up. I know you're um, a patron of the, of the project to get this, the multi-faith center mm. funded. Um, can you explain why? A university is a very, very good place to, um, to model encounter and dialogue. Barely needs saying, but if encounter and dialogue are good in themselves, then universities ought to encourage them in religion as in other matters. And I think this is a hugely imaginative project, which, without compromising anyone's convictions or claims, just says, well, here is a space you can share and where it's safe to be yourself and where you've got time and space to listen to, to your neighbours. I, th I think that's, that's a wonderful ideal. And uh, I think there are places around the country that try that, um, like St. Ethelburgers in London. Um, I think the more of those we have, the better. I've got one last very brief question for you. Um, the Simpsons. I, hmm. I gather that's your favourite TV programme. I'm not sure whether this is because of the various moral and ethical dilemmas they, they cover, hmm. or just because it's so bloody funny. Maybe you can... Um, it's, of course it's because of the moral and ethical dilemmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's actually rather encouraging that a brilliantly popular programme can take a number of quite serious human issues and make them funny and leave you with with some real questions. But yes, I, mean, I, I still <laughs> sort of switch off work for half an hour and go and join the family to watch The Simpsons at six o'clock. My other um, addiction on television, it's the only other one really, is The West Wing. Ah, uh -huh. um, yes, indeed. Because, you know, watching somebody in the public eye um, stagger from cowpat to cowpat <laughs> in a rather frantic Rings. lifestyle. <laughs> it Rings mouth. Reminds me of something. <laughs> <laughs> Archbishop, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have probably about 20 minutes, I think, okay. as we started late. So, so well, you, maybe you have already enough to cover. <laughs> I think I probably have. Um, <laughs> He's meticulously okay. putting them into categories. Trying to. <laughs> right. Oh, here's a nice one. Do you ever think you might be wrong? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's an easy one. Um, right. Um, okay. Let's take one or two here. Our beliefs inform our actions, so surely we should rid ourselves of as many false beliefs as possible, despite the comfort they may provide. Query. Um, I think that's right. And I think the most damaging false beliefs are often beliefs about ourselves. And therefore, I would say that part of the function of real faith is to help us question ourselves in the most honest and constructive way we can and shed false beliefs about who we are and what we can do. I guess, though, that behind that is, is a deeper question about um, well, really about belief and superstition. The word superstition means superfluous belief originally. And I think it's, again, fair enough that we should constantly be testing our belief systems to see if they hang together, to see if everything is as important as it at first seems, that kind of thing. And um, that does relate a bit to you have one minute to persuade an atheist to become a Christian. <laughs> what would you say? 
I would, of course, say you can't expect me to do that in one minute, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> Secondly, I'd say it's up to God, not to me, which is a wonderful sort of let out clause. But I would then say, look at the lives of Christians at their fullest and best. Look at what Christianity has made possible for people. Look at the Martin Luther Kings or the Desmond Tutus of the world and ask, have they got something I need? And see where the conversation went from there. And a similarly sort of focused and sharp one, three, what three ways can the individual act in to um, help a neighborhood to become more fully neighborly? It's a very good question, I think. And I think my answer would be First of all, ask yourself, am I capable of being trusted by my neighbors? Am I reliable? Am I a consistent friend? Is my door open? Secondly, what can I do to assist neighbors and a neighborhood to achieve harmoniously what they most deeply need and want? And I think thirdly, how do I persuade neighbors and neighborhood to take seriously and creatively the needs of the children of the neighborhood, given that that's where we actually sow the seeds for real change? And maybe those would be three things that we could look at in the life of a community. Here's a very strange question. Is it true that you accidentally pushed Sir Henry Fielden into a pond? <laughs> Um, I'm afraid not, but I'd be very interested to know where, where that came from. <laughs> do you think that the Church of England and churches in general could do more to alleviate suffering in the world? Um, for example, the anti-gay law in Uganda, violence in Iraq and poverty in Zimbabwe. We could always do more to alleviate suffering in the world, always. But just to take the examples that there are there, the anti-gay law in Uganda, which of course is not yet a law and please God never will be, is something about which the Anglican Church in Uganda has had a diversity of opinions. They have actually resisted the idea that there should be a death penalty and their comments on the law have been far more nuanced than people might have expected. So although I don't agree with much of what the Anglican Church in Uganda has said, they have been attempting to tone down what I think is the, the real um, violent bigotry of the first draft of this private member's motion. And there are people in Uganda, very, very brave people, who have been doing pioneering work with especially HIV AIDS um, circumstances, who have spoken out comprehensively against this bill. One of the bravest people I know Canon Gideon Biamogisha, who runs a, an HIV AIDS clinic, um, was one of the first to, to speak out against the proposed legislation as the first priest on the African con continent to admit publicly that he was living with HIV. That's a brave man, and I don't think he can do very much more, whatever else others might do in support of him. Violence in Iraq. I don't know where we begin with that. There are people who seek to tone down the appalling violence there, the communal violence. There are Christians in the middle of that who at the moment, as we speak, are suffering atrociously. Christians who have been butchered in cold blood by extremists in the last couple of weeks. What we can do from here is limited. We can keep up the pressure for peacemaking generally as best we can. Poverty in Zimbabwe. The Archbishop of York and I last year, almost exactly a year ago, launched an Archbishop's <coughs> Appeal for Zimbabwe when circumstances there were looking very bleak. And the appeal in the last 12 months has raised the best part of half a million. That's money that goes to community projects throughout Zimbabwe, education and healthcare, 
and also training in basic sustainable agricultural methods. So we do, we do have some, some partnerships there which make a bit of difference. And I say that not in any spirit of self-defense or um, self-congratulation as if we were doing plenty, but just to say what is as a matter of bare fact being done in the hope that that inspires people to go on seeking to do more. A bit about theology. To what extent is God an actor in the world rather than obser an observer? Which is, a, again, a very interesting question. There are lots of very interesting questions here. Um, God is never just an observer because I believe, as, as a Christian, that the world exists because God is always acting. I like to say sometimes creation is not something that happened a long time ago. It is something that is happening now in the sense that we are here because the act of God is still, if you like, bubbling away beneath the surface, upholding us moment by moment. Which not, is not the same which thing is not the same as fiddling around. Tweaking, but, yeah. But yeah. just this, you know, the supply of energy pouring through, as you might say, that's what holds us in being. So always an actor, never an observer. God doesn't make the world and then sit back and, and look at it from a distance and say, oh, there we are, pretty good if you ask me, and go and do something else. But I think the question is also about how far we may expect God to be actively making a difference in the world. Now, as I understand it, God's energy, God's life, which is, as I say, bubbling under the surface, can, on occasion, so seep into the actions of men and women that possibilities you would never have imagined come to be real. And that's part of what we've meant by miracle, not God reaching down and twiddling, sort of separating the fabric of creation and inserting a direct act. Much more, the world coming to a point where something is allowed to, to come through of what is always going on beneath or come into focus. In that sense, yes, I, I certainly believe God acts, but acts through the freedom, the activity of what he's made, not parting the heavens and interrupting the fabric of things, but working through. And that still allows you to say, I believe, that extraordinary things happen and extraordinary possibilities become realities. What would be the benefits of disestablishing the Church of England now? <laughs> um, actually, not very many, I think. Um, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've never been a huge advocate of establishment in its own right. I grew up in a disestablished church in Wales. I worked as a bishop for nearly 11 years in a disestablished church in Wales and didn't think that disestablishment was the end of the world. But people who talk about disestablishment these days are very often people who have an agenda of trying to keep religious discourse out of the public sphere. And I'm, you know, I'm quite prepared to be bloody-minded about that and say, well, if that's your reason for disestablishment, I'm not interested because I think we need to be in there arguing. And so I'll resist it if that's where it's coming from. And I think what what would result would not be a kind of calm, rational, neutral public discourse in this country. It would be a carefully fenced off area of public life with a lot of rather frustrated religious voices around the edges, grumbling, muttering and trying to get back in. Whereas at the moment, paradoxically, the establishment of the church does help to remind society as a whole that it's OK for religious voices to be part of public discussion not to dominate, not to decide everything, but to be a respected part of that argument about the social good. Those of you who've seen Michael Sandel's recent book on justice, you know, he was the Reith lecturer last year, will see where some of this argument um, latches on to that. And it's a very interesting book by someone who doesn't have an ax to grind on this subject. A few questions about science. Interesting one here, how can science and religion be compatible when science relies on objectivity and religion relies, relies upon faith? I think the short answer to that is 
different kinds of questions require different kinds of discourse in answer. And science and religion can be compatible if they're not competing. Things go rather badly wrong, I would say, when faith tries to answer scientific questions, you know, the wrong kind of creation, pseudo, pseudoscience in creationism, or when science invades the territory of human meaning and imagination and commitment and says, well, you know, this is the evidence, so this is what you ought to think. So, for example, if it is possible to go forward with this scientific development, it must be right, because we can do it. And that seems to me science intruding on another realm. Compatibility means not trying to compete, recognising there are different questions that are being answered. And I don't see that there's any great problem there. In fact, of course, there's more overlap than that because science certainly relies on objectivity in the sense that it looks for hard, sustainable evidence and for means of falsifying the theories it puts forward. At the same time, science advances by leaps of imagination sometimes, which are not yet justified, and you try and justify them. It's not as if science is kind of narrowly functionalist, never taking those great leaps for the paradigm shifts that sure. um, philosophers of science talk about. Likewise, um, I wouldn't be a Christian if I didn't think there was something in the history of the world that, at the very least, gave me some foundation to go on. For me, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. There's no scientific reason to suppose that God exists. Why do you think she does? <laughs> nice touch. Um, <laughs> well, for how many things in your life do you need a scientific reason? The reasons we advance for preferring Mozart to Bach, preferring Yvonne to Janet, preferring broccoli to peas. Those are not entirely trivial examples, but the reasons we advance will not be exactly what you mean by scientific reasons, but the reasons. There is a reasoning process that we can sometimes say, well, this is where my experience leads me. This is what brings things together, what makes sense. I prefer Bach to Mozart, let's say, because somehow I feel I'm introduced into a larger world in the one that I'm in the other, and so on. There is reasoning that goes on, but it's not exactly what you'd think of as scientific reasoning. And this is partly my gripe about Richard Dawkins again, the assumption that there's one kind of reasoning, one kind of knowing, hard knowledge, not soft, you know, that you've got scientific knowledge and the rest is just kind of fuzzy, opinionated waffle. And I just don't think that's what the human world is like. I don't think that's what the human mind is like. So I'm um, not too fussed about there being no scientific reason to suppose that God exists. There may be any number of human reasons arising out of how we read the world around us and our own experience. Is science able to explain the underlying principles of religions, and if so, should it? Are there questions we may be able to answer but shouldn't address from a religious point of view? I think it's very dangerous to think that religion tells you there are questions you must never ask or seek to answer. That's, that's a mistake in a way that bits of religion have made all too often in the past, isn't it? By saying, well, you, you can't ask that, you can't talk like that here. And I think the religious believer has to, well, to put his or her money where their mouth is and say, if, if faith is what it, what it claims to be, then I will look, I will look in the face of the scientific enterprise and say, okay, go ahead, do your worst. I stake my position here. If you can shake that, well, I'll be very interested to see it, but not to be afraid of that. I don't, as a matter of fact, think, see previous remarks, that science will explain it away because that in itself presupposes the model of one kind of science, one kind of knowing, one kind of reasoning. 
But I don't think there's anything to be afraid of. I think we need to have the confidence of our faith to say, go ahead, ask the questions you want to ask. If he, and the he is presumably God here, was starting a church from scratch, which parts of the Church of England would you be glad to lose? <laughs> um. <clears throat> this is where you start losing friends. <laughs> starting a church from scratch, it's, it's actually an exercise that I, I like to do sometimes with parishes to say, you're, you're starting a church. Forget what's going on on Sunday mornings. Forget the, the habits you're in. Just look at the New Testament. Think about the essence of your faith and commitment. What would you really need to get it going? And that can at least help you start asking the, the sharp, the, the razor-edged questions. And very often, of course, people will say, we don't necessarily need the buildings we've got. We don't necessarily need the whole culture of worship that we've got. And they say that not to claim we've got to get rid of all those. They're unimportant. They have no use. Just to set a bit of an order of priorities. So I think the question ought to make us focus on what's actually different about the church. What's different about the church? What is it that makes it not just another human organization, just another club? To focus on what it is in our life and our language that reminds us that we exist because of God's choice and invitation, as I said earlier, to remind us that whatever horrendous mess we make of our lives through sin and failure, God is faithful in giving us new beginnings. What focuses us on those things? So I'd, I think perhaps I'm saying I'm coming at it positively rather than negatively, not trying to trim off with sort of plastic surgery what, what isn't necessary, but looking first at what's, what's really central. Do you have oh. time for one Ooh. last question, oh, probably, dear, dear. Brief. I think we've pretty much um, run out, almost run out of time. I'm sorry. Um, no, no. Waffling no. on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what have I given up for Lent and why? Um, <laughs> alcohol and coffee. Um, <laughs> which political party will you vote for at the general election? Um, I'm tempted to say Plaid Cymru. <laughs> 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 but actually, as a member of the House of Lords, I don't vote. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, there's a little cluster of related short personal ones which I reply to. What's your favourite hymn and why? Probably um, Charles Wesley's And Can It Be That I Should Gain an Interest in the Saviour's Blood? And chiefly because of the stunning imagery there about liberation. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Unimprovable to me. <laughs> Two people ask about which Bible verse or passage has had most significance in my Christian life. And that's quite difficult to answer because if, like me as an Anglican cleric, you read the Bible a lot every day, um, so much of it comes to mind. But I think it's probably from 2 Corinthians. We all with unveiled faces are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. That would be one of them, certainly. If I could take one book to a desert island with me, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't think why this guy is <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, I don't know. I'd be quite tempted, I think, to take 
the complete works of one or another poet that I love, possibly George Herbert, or maybe if I were feeling a bit adventurous, W.H. Auden. You, 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 of course, you're a published poet yourself, aren't you? I, yes. I think we should, yes. Uh, should, we should say. I, I think I'd leave my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have to draw this to a close. I think you'll join me in agreeing that it's been an entertaining, informative, thoughtful, dare I say spiritual uh, evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to, the, to those in the Overflow and the Austin Pierce. Uh, you'll find where you were. It's really no better seeing the Archbishop in the flesh, honestly. You didn't miss much. <laughs> um, do, do keep an eye out for... for the next in the series of these Jim Meets uh, occasions. I'm, I'm hoping, David Attenborough has tentatively said yes, so we're hoping he'll be coming along in a few months' time. In the meantime, please join me in thanking the Archbishop for a wonderful evening. Thanks.